welcome you all to scary acronyms and super creeps. Um, we'll be talking about OIBITs, HRTBs, and other tremor abbreviations. So let before we delve into the code, let's start with some black end statement. Let's say many interesting things happened in the past. Hard to agree, hard to disagree. As an example, uh, did you know that on this September 2nd in the 18th century, six and a half million Britons went to bed and woke up uh, 12 days later, just, just like that. And the reason was that uh, Britain legislated something called Calendar New Style Act of 1750. But to understand what was the underneath purpose for just such, such an arbitrary jump in calendar, we get we got to go back around 150 years uh, before. So uh, the guy you can see, um, by the way, um, I have opened the presentation on on my phone. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write them. I, I will try to answer as soon as I see them. So this guy is Pope Gregory the 13th. Uh, in the 16th century, he was 10 years into his reign as the leader of the Catholic Church, and he had a bit of a problem with Easter. So to understand why he had a problem with Easter, you got to remember that in, in the 16th century, Julian calendar was still all the hype. Um, and the Julian calendar measured a year as 365 days and six hours long, which is close, but not exactly a more calibrated, uh, calibrated span of uh, five hours and 49 minutes. And 11 minutes doesn't seem that long, 11 minutes each year, but over the time it accumulates. And so, sorry, slides a bit, a bit, a bit jumping. Yeah, so Pope Gregory, afraid that let's say the Earth days have over the time diverged from the actual ones, and declared that countries should just skip a few days to catch up so that the holidays are on time. And in 16th century, most countries under the Catholic dominionship agreed, Britain did not, until the 1752. So in 1752, the Britain eventually legislated the Calendar New Style Act, and just like that, 11 days were cut off, uh, 11 days were cut from uh, everyone's life. That, that was quite a bit of a trivia, so let's fast forward a few years and see what, what <clears throat> and see what, what, what things happened in 2013. So, for instance, there was FIFA World Cup. I'm not into, into soccer myself, but I presume most people were, or at least many people were, you know, were having fun back then. Also, Marek Savicki was appointed to the position of Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in Poland. Also, not my... Not, not, not quite think I'm interested in, but it happened. And the thing I'm interested in is this document. So this is an excerpt from the Rust RFCS repository. And uh, it was written by, <coughs> uh, um, sorry, I actually don't remember who wrote it. Sorry if, if, you, if you watch this presentation, but the most, thing is, uh, the most important thing is that it happened in 2013. And the document was talking about a thing called OIBIT. And to understand what OIBITs are, let's see them from the practical side. For instance, let's start with creating a wrapper for a static string. And then let's create a, an instance of this struct. And just for the kicks, let's send it to another thread. As we can see, uh, we have thread spawn, which creates another thread. We move the text into the thread and then just print it. We also do join unwrap so that we wait for thread to actually print something, but that's the, the least important part. So my question is, why does this code compile? And you might think why it shouldn't compile, but 
but first you gotta understand that not all values can be safely uh, safely sent across thread boundaries. For instance, we can't send RCs because internally they don't use thread safe counters. So for instance, the code you see right now wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be compiled. You would see that RC cannot be sent between threads safely. And that's that's a very valid error message because if we were able to do that, we could create one instance of the RC, for instance, holding the number 132, then clone it, which doesn't clone the number itself, just the, just the uh, pointer to it. And if we could send RC to the thread boundary, we would uh, we'd be able to perform race read or race write. Um, because at this point, when we're inside the thread spawn, the RC mm, could contain the previous value or the new one. And, Rust, and so that this is the reason Rust forbids sending RC to the thread boundary. You could use us and mutex, but that changes the semantics a bit. So generally, to distinguish between values or types that can be sent across thread boundaries and values or types which cannot be, Rust uses the send trait. So yeah, only when a type implements send, it can be sent safely into another thread. And as always, since Rust is statically typed language, we can confirm this by looking at the definition of thread spawn. We can see clearly that it requires that the function must be sent. So let's go back to another question. Since we don't have an explicit impulse sent for our wrapper, why does this code compile? How does Rust know that it's safe to send this wrapper to another thread? And here, here's the first time we, we get to meet OIBITs. And OIBIT stands for opt-in built-in trait. And there are two vital things you have to know about opt-in built-in traits. First one is that they are neither opt-in and they are neither built-in, mostly. Later, the feature was renamed to auto traits. So from this point on, we're going to stick to the new terminology. And we'll see why they aren't neither opt-in, neither built-in. So generally, when you have a trait like display or virtually anyone, uh, you have to implement it by hand. For instance, our string wrapper doesn't implement uh, FMT display on its own. We have to manually implement it. So that's why Rust traits are opt-in. But we also have auto traits and which are implemented automatically unless we explicitly opt out of them. So uh, our string wrapper implements send unless we use the negative bound to say that it shouldn't implement. So yeah, we can, we can add the negative implementation and then our code won't compile. We'll see that the string wrapper cannot be sent between threads. And generally, the rule is that any type automatically implements auto trade, well, any auto trade, be it sent or anyone, when all fields of that type, when it's struct, when it's enum all variants, and so on, implement x2. So, for instance, we have, oh, sorry, it was sludge too much. Is the one. So if we were to create, for example, a new struct called word, which would contain the word itself and synonyms and antonyms, this struct would implement send because compiler analyzes each field and sees that string already implements send, which is defined in the standard library. So we all have access to that. And the vector implements send when its inner type does. So we have basically strings, strings implement send, the whole struct can be sent. If we, for example, were to switch to just one field is enough, and we know that SE isn't uh, thread safe, SE can be sent between uh, into another thread, so the entire struct does not implement send. So, for instance, SE doesn't implement send. Uh, row pointers also don't implement send because since row pointers are usually used with like to link to various C libraries and stuff, which usually do not implement uh, multi-threading correctly. By the default, when you use raw pointers, this is not a reference, this is raw pointer. 
this struct also isn't sent. And it isn't magic. The sent trait is defined in the standard library. You can find it yourself if you want, even right now. We can see that we have auto trait. And this is uh, literally the definition of the trait with the empty end stuff. And we can see that, <clears throat> uh, that the standard library automatically opts out it for uh, row pointers, for LC, and for many other types. Also, since it's like part of the language itself, you can also build your own auto traits. For instance, we have we can create auto trait named friend. By the default, it's implemented for all types, and unless we opt in, so we make all types our friends except for string. Then we can see that the code works for, for example, row string, but doesn't work for string because we uh, opted out from it. Apart from the send and sing, I haven't really haven't really seen it in, used in practice. But if you want, you can too. Uh, I saw there were some some ideas how to use it in Serda, but I don't think they eventually settled on that. But, uh, just so that I can introduce myself, I'm Patrick Vychowaniec. You can find me on Reddit, Kibay's GitHub for programmers if you're a Polish person and many other forums if you write comments on the internet we've probably argued at some point so hello so let's meet another nice acronym hrtbs and as before as with oibits let's find them hidden in plain sight let's create a struct called movie make it make it contain some title and year And let's create some function called print, which will accept the movie itself and some function um, so that we can print the movie in various fashions. For example, as a JSON, as XML, as, you know, just by to string or debug representation. The main point is that we have function that accepts another function. And since that's all we need to know at this point, we can already write the way this function should work. We'll be just printing to the standard output and the result of the serialized function itself. It's tiny because just it's just an example. But yeah, so we can create some movie, then invoke print with to do because we don't have any serialized serializer function at this point. And before we implement some serializer function, let's actually um, take a look, look how our serializer type should work because we use it here, but we haven't defined it before. So we have type serializer. And well, first things first, it has to be generic over T. I mean, it technically hasn't, but let's just say it will be generic because we want to use it for, for some other structs too. Second fact, we want it to be a function. So yeah, then function, some, some argument and some return type. For sure, we want it to return string because let's say we'll just serialize everything into strings, most convenient form. And make it accept, yeah, make it accept the object it wants to serialize. So yeah, that's the definition of a serializer type. And voila, that's how it fits with all our code. So this way we have the serializer type and the movie struct, some function, which uses the serializer type. And the thing we're missing is some actual code that would provide the serializing function. And for that, let's use Serda. So yeah, we included Serda, we've derived serialize on our movie, and then we can create the to JSON function, which matches the definition of our serializer. So it takes some type by reference and returns a string. Actually, we can implement it to JSON function because it just served a JSON to string. And at this point, the code contains small mistake, but that's all right. We have an issue saying mismatched types. We have, we have function print that accepts a reference to a function and we provided just name of the function. So the, so the compiler says that he's expecting a reference and he just found function item. And 
the hint it gives is all right. If we just push the ampersand in there, uh, we, <clears throat> everything would be solved. But that's that's not what I'm. That's not what I want to focus. Um, let's take a look at the note. It says expected reference, which is our serializer function supposedly, and found if an item which is our to JSON which compiler points out. And the peculiar thing is that what's this then for thinking? We didn't write it anywhere. How does what's what? How does the compiler can expect from us something we didn't write? And so let's go back to our type and find out what happened. And what might struck you at this point, because this definition is all right the way it is. It compiles, but you might. So you might wonder what's the what's the lifetime of the reference this function accepts. Usually, we have to when lifetimes are involved, you have to somehow annotate them. And in here we just wrote pointer. So in here we just put ampersand reference, and it works. So what, what's happening underneath? And the answer is lifetime elision. And generally, lifetime elision is a mechanism um, so that common lifetime patterns are automatically uh, are automatically uh, detected by the compiler so that in the most obvious cases you don't have to write the lifetimes you can write most of your program never annotating the lifetimes unless you for example uh, create a struct accepting a reference but if you are just user of some function you barely have to have to annotate them and to provide you the scope of what where, when is the lifetime elision used? Uh, well, let's just say that our tiny example used lifetime elision three times. First one is in here. We have two references, and we didn't write explicitly any of it. So actually, this should we should have. If you if we were to lay out the types explicitly, we should have two lifetimes. Let's say a and b, one for self and one for the function. Next, we had the to JSON function, which also accepted a reference uh, when we didn't annotate the lifetime. This one is also basic, just classical one. And then, then we have our serializer. So to annotate the lifetime we want, we gotta we gotta think what we want our function to do. Or how do we want our function to look like? Because from our point of view, what we want is a function that will work for any lifetime. Since our serializer function doesn't return borrowed data, and the lifetime of the reference it accepts doesn't really matter. It can be anything as long as it is a reference. So the first thing, if you don't know what, what AHRDBs are, uh, the first thing you could do is to annotate the lifetime uh, before the, uh, the generic type. And this is solution, kinda. But first of all, it poisons uh, every place where you use the serializer type. You would have to annotate it everywhere you use the serializer type, so it would be very cumbersome to use. And as we see later in a few places, it would be even impossible to apply correctly. And we already said that we want our serializer to work for any lifetime not a specific one so why don't why we say that our type works for specific lifetime so the way to write the serializer type is to use hrtbs which unravels into higher into higher ranked trade bounds the name is not very straightforward but it kind of makes sense when you see it at play so the way to use hrtbs uh, is to use the for syntax. So thanks to this, we say that our serializer definition uh, is a function that works for any lifetime. Any lifetime, any lifetime this function uh, happens to be invoked on will be okay. And that's thanks to the hrtb created by the for construction. So yeah, basically it means I don't care about the concrete lifetime, make it work for everyone. And it, when you see it for the first time, 
you might think that it, for example, that that you can use it uh, for something more than lifetimes. For example, you could try to create some type uh, like for TT. So I don't know what it might have meant. So like any type or that any pointer or any vector, or any box vector, but HRTBs work only for lifetimes. They are used to, uh, they used to kind of erase the lifetime when you don't care for it. And not to stop on one example, because it's like not give the one example doesn't give like a whole view why HRTBs are useful. Let's find another one in the wild. Let's create a function. Let's make that function create an object inside it. And let's make our function accept a callback. And we'll invoke that callback with the object we've created inside this function. So yeah, example usage might look like this. And the way it, the way it looks right now is all right. It will actually print more existential crisis. But once again, let's focus on the, the function's definition and see that since it accepts the callback and this callback accepts a reference to string, we might wonder once again, what, what's this lifetime exactly? Because you know, lifetime elision kicked in and it works, but uh, e even though it works, the, the, the lifetime it accepts isn't pretty straightforward. Because for instance, if you were to make our function generate over a lifetime, it would at this point break. The yeah, computer says no. And that's because the compiler says that motto doesn't live long enough. We have our function definition. It says that we defined a lifetime that we yeah, that we have argument that we borrow for the lifetime A, which is like from this point of view, it's true because yeah, we accept the callback that requires the lifetime A to be in place. And the compiler says that the borrowed value doesn't live long enough, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it makes very much sense if you take a look at the call site. Yeah, so we have our function with generic lifetime. And if you were to somehow name the lifetime, we're invoking the call me maybe with, what would it be? What's this lifetime? How would you an annotate it? From, from main's point of view, the lifetime doesn't depend on anything main can provide. So why is it our function generic over any lifetime? Because if we were to somehow visualize what's happening, then we would have some, let's say, lifetime motto, which starts inside the call me maybe and ends inside the call me maybe. And that's the lifetime we expect our callback to use, the lifetime of the motto. But we made our function generic over any lifetime. So, so it, it's no wonder the compiler doesn't understand us. And actually the what we want to say to the compiler is that we want to invoke call me maybe with a callback that accepts some reference, but we can't can't name it. We don't care how we we don't care what's exactly the lifetime of it as long as it's a reference so it's a similar case to the one we had with serializer we want to have callback or serializing function and invoke it with some lifetime we either can't or don't care to name and once again this is where hierarchy train bouts come to the rescue the way to write it is that's our original function and to use HRTBs, we use the for construction. Uh, previously, we had it then for. This time, it's impl uh, because we're uh, we're actually expecting precise callback. So we have uh, impl, and the syntax is similar for lifetime. And we use that that lifetime we we created just for the sake of this trade bound. So yeah, this is the, the second case when HRTBs come to the rescue. 
So basically, um, when you don't have a way to name the lifetime, which usually happens with callbacks, like you said, both, both examples invoke uh, involved uh, callbacks or functions whatsoever, uh, and you cannot find a way to name that lifetime, you probably should use HRTBs. And you got to remember that most of the time lifetime elision kicks in and you really don't have to use this for construction. I recall code base. Um, when I try to remember when we, uh, when I had chance to use it at work, I actually just recall like one or two places where the lifetime elision had issues and we had to actually annotate and use the input for. But most of the time, you just don't care. You just say, for example, the way we had originally just pull of then with reference, and it just works. But if you were curious what's happening underneath, is that HRTBs. The next scary acronym is GATs. And once again, let's just start with code. We have the well-known iterator trait. Uh, it's in the most basic version, it just uh, it contains associated type uh, called item, which is the uh, the type of the uh, item the iterator yields. For example, iterator of strings would have string as an item and so on. And the next function which just returns the next item or none when the iterator is finished. So it's got some nice pros. It's like really simple and tidy. You can say it's four lines of code. It does its job and has been with us since like forever. But it's got some nasty cons too. Well, actually, just just one. So maybe the plural is not appropriate. And that con is that we can't return. Oh, let's ask it. How do we return data that borrows from the iterator? That may seem like weird and abstract question at first. So as always, let's get some, let's get our hands on some code that would benefit from this iterator. We had this like. 10 lines of code and what it does, it opens a file, it starts a buffer reader, then iterates through each line. And it's perfectly fine the way it is, it works, but it's got, um, it's all right-ish because it's a bit suboptimal. And the thing is that for each line, um, we got a separate string. Actually, each line is result string IO error. So that's why we need the unwrap. But let's simplify a bit and just focus on the fact that each line is a newly allocated string uh, freed uh, when, the, when each iteration finishes. So for example, for file containing 1,000 lines, the Rust would have to allocate, allocate and free 1,000 strings. That's, that's not an ideal solution because ideally, our buff reader would just return borrowed strings. So it would contain just one allocation of string, probably reallocated to, to adjust to the uh, uh, to, to lines of greater length, but it would be one string. And the thing we would be receiving in here would be just pointer to string. This way we would have one allocation plus minus reallocations while the buff reader is working. So naturally, a question arises, why, can, why can't we have uh, lines? So that's the object you get by uh, invoking the lines method. Why can't lines be iterator uh, from uh, iterator borrowing to str right now? I don't know, it's maybe because some big Rust farmer doesn't want you to know about truly zero cost abstractions. And as always to find out, let's just try to create such iterator. So we're starting by creating a struct. Let's call it smart lines. And let's make it uh, accept any reader so that we can, for example, plug and play it for, for the, the lines we have at this point. So yeah, it will, con it will contain the actual reader. So for example, the file or buff read and the line. That's the, that's the thing I was talking about. We'll use a single allocation. And yeah, let's create some constructor. It will accept the reader. Let's say the buff reader. And we'll create a new line on this spot. Then we get to the, uh, to the most important stuff, which is 
our input iterator. And as we said before, we would like for the iterator to return uh, both strings. So we say that the item uh, is reference to string. We have the next function we have to do because we don't care how to implement it right now. We just want the types to match. And actually at this point, the code is broken. Like on a fundamental level, uh, it just won't compile because the Rust will say that we're missing a lifetime specifier. So we have this type item and Rust doesn't know what the lifetime of the strings will be returning from the next function. Uh, it wants us to... Lifetime is introduced near the mat self. So yeah, let's, let's not give up though. Let's just implement iterator for a reference. So we have a standard input iterator. And this time, instead of for smart lines, will be implemented for reference to smart lines. This way we'll have our lifetime called A. We can name the lifetime for the, for this, uh, for the item. And yeah, let's just create some, let's just actually create the next function uh, and make it return the, the line from, from, uh, from our struct. And if we try to compile it, Rust gives all this litany of errors that basically boil down to the fact that what we have here and the the all it all boils down to the fact to the fact uh, that when we have the mat self to the next uh, the reference near the mat self the reference of the mat self uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the a so it may be the case that, for instance, we have smart lines that are borrowed for less than A or more than A. And we, for example, return trash data from, from old stale memory. So the way we could try to solve it is to annotate that we want the, the borrow of self to live uh, as long as the, the strings we're returning. And yeah, yeah, if if that if that worked, we wouldn't have we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The issue is that if we use the new fn next with annotated mod self, the compiler warns us that originally it had uh, the trade the iterator trade contains different definition for the fn next. You can see that Rust compiles it. Uh, the the definition we set is. A mod, A mod smart lines, which is weird type, but okay, word flex. And the first expected FN pointer is the one from the trade. And we can see that it's it doesn't have the, the first reference isn't necessarily the A. And we cannot force compiler into believing us that it will be the same because I mean, we don't know if it's the same. So actually uh, the way we've been trying to approach this problem is kind of fundamentally broken. And there is a solution. It invokes GAT, so let's unravel this acronym. It's generic associated types. So the associated type for the iterator trade is the item. And the issue is that if we provide, if we were to provide some item as a, as a reference to something, we can't, can't name the value, can't name the lifetime at all. But we could name it if we were to imagine that there exists some streaming iterator. And when we have the type item, if we could make it generic over a lifetime, then we could name it. Because if we have uh, item generic over a lifetime, that we, then we have the lifetime introduced at this point. And we can just say that these strings are uh, attached to the lifetime from the uh, from the associated type, and then we we would be able to implement the next method with the uh, that uses the self item and provides the lifetime from the mat self. And actually, it's been possible for a while on Nightly. 
it's got a few soundness issues so it's far from stabilization from what i've seen but the trait you see right now in front of your screen can be implemented so that that's that's really neat it really opens a door for 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 very interesting traits and well the name of the feature says that it's generic associated types and for now it's only generic associated lifetimes you can have only associated types uh, generic by lifetimes but eventually and this is the more interesting stuff. Oh, sorry, I saw we have a question. Um, isn't it breaking uh, immutable ref when immutable one uh, exists from the from the way we've been trying to do at this point? Or well, let me navigate. Do you mean this code or different one? Uh, no, actually, uh, yes. Yeah, so when we have, let me just navigate to when I finished. Um, actually, it's not breaking uh, immutable reference. Um, doing the doing it the other way around. So if you started with immutable one and somehow ended up with mutable one is breaking, but when you have mutable one, you can say if you shorten it. To the to the immutable one, so it's so it's actually safe. And okay, so yeah, GITs uh, with lifetimes, but eventually, uh, the whole feature says generic associated types, but not lifetimes. So eventually, we'll be able to create. Uh, for instance, traits such as this. This is called pointer family. This is a trait that contains associated type called pointer that just contains the reference to the pointer. It is quite hard to understand. It took me a while, but let's let's navigate to some more code. We have this trait called pointer family, and then we, for example, can create a struct called arc family and implement this trait. Uh, for arc, and this way we have arc family that will return our pointers to arcs, and for example, RC family returning pointers to RCs. Currently, this can be done without generic associated types because, for example, you can write type pointer equals to arc because arc requires and RC both require specifying the type you mean to 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 include in them. But if we have generic associated types, the way we have pointer, generic over team, we can just say that, we, that our arc uh, gets the type from the G18. And this is like nice, nice for, nice as uh, for a quiz or something, but it also opens the door for, for example, structs that can be dynamically switched from arcs to RCs. So for example, if you're developing a library, you usually have to decide or feature gate it whether you want to use arcs and make your library thread safe or use RCs and make your library tiny bit faster, but not thread safe. This means that, for example, when you as a user of any library uh, decides to make, for example, switch and make your program thread safe, you got to first ensure that all your dependencies are thread safe too. I mean, obviously Rust, Rust keeps track of that. Uh, Rust keeps track of that. So in the worst case, you will be just presented with compiler error. But it would be great if you could, for example, include a library and tell it to use thread safe, uh, thread safe uh, structs, thread safe types. And this is what the GATs will allow us. Uh, we have the example of full struct that is generic over pointer family. And this, the way we will be able to do in the hopefully near future, will allow us to create, for example, a full arc family, which make the bar arc of string, and we'll be able to create full RC family, which will track full with bar to RC string. And yeah, like I said, it will make uh, it will be great times for library developers because they won't have to 
I do on the time when I created libraries, whether they want them to be threat safe or not. They will just say, for example, that there are generic over the pointers and you as a user will decide the library to use threat safe or non threat safe. And as a bonus acronym, initially this feature was called associated type constructors. So if you ever get to see ATCs somewhere, PJ. Now we're actually getting near, near, near the finish. This is like, this is the, one of the most basic acronyms will uh, present in this presentation. Um, so what do you think will be the out output of this code? We have empty struct, empty enum. We have size of, of two parentheses and size of, ex, of ex, exclamation mark. So yeah, first of all, this is valid code. Um, yeah, almost valid. Uh, the, the, the exclamation mark type is experimental and we'll see in a minute uh, why. So if we add the feature, and now compile and run this code, and uh, we will see four zeros. So size of empty struct is zero. Well, kind of naturally empty struct. Uh, so is size of empty enum. Again, kind of naturally empty enum. And then the parentheses and exclamation mark. So one might think, uh, yeah, and the ZST obviously stands for zero size type. And one might think that they are kind of unnecessary baggage because type uh, are used to and values are meant to carry some information. So when we have zero size type that doesn't carry any information or carries barely some information and that uh, that is useless, but it's actually the opposite. For instance, uh, in Rust we have hash map and similarly it's bit three map and bit reset and they are defined similarly. And if we take a look at the standard library scope, we'll find out that the hash set <clears throat> is actually just hash map uh, with values uh, as unit type. Unit type is that the parentheses we've seen before that contain no value. Actually, the parentheses is a value itself, but it cannot be changed. That's why the size of is zero. And um, so we have hash set. And thanks to the fact that we have zero size types, Rust knows that the, the, the ha this hash map from which, 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 is, which is used by hash set, Rust knows that this hash map contains basically only keys because the values are always these unit types. It cannot be changed. And Rust just, an LLVM, strips all the unnecessary code from hash map that would be used to, for example, return values. So it's actually kind of zero, zero cost abstraction that you can use hash map with unit type as the value and end up with hash set. As always, you can take a look in the standard library. This is like literally the, the free line excerpt from it. And yeah, one, one peculiar thing about the, the unit type is that it's both a type and a value. So we have definition of the uh, of a variable called foo and we can use parentheses to mean type and both value. So this is kind of like an empty tuple and it's best understood this way. And previously I've said that we had, we had those four types. It was empty struct, empty enum, the unit type, and we had the four type, uh, which was the exclamation mark, which is called the never type. And it serves similar purpose to the, to the unit type with one key difference you cannot at all obtain a value of this type. So it's a bit counterintuitive. So let's compare it to something. For example, let's, let's take this table, uh, let's take this type on the table. Result from string and unit and unit type. We can create some function called print me that accepts this result uh, matches and when it's okay it prints okay when it's error it prints error and then invoke it from the main function with both variants we can invoke it with okay and let's say with uh, with value pancake and we can invoke it with error with value of the unit type of the empty tuple and as it is this code works so 
Now let's compare it with result from string and the, the never type. Uh, the printing function is similar. It just we just changed the type of the val to be string and never type. And the difference, the key difference, is at the call side. The first one with print me okay remains the same, but the second one with the error is different. We actually can't at all construct the error variant when we had the the unit type. We could construct the error variant. It was empty, but we could construct it. And contrary to the uh, to the never type, we we when we have result from string and never type or whatever and never type, we cannot con get the value of, of the never type. So that still you might still wonder why is this never type useful apart from possibly generic code. So, for example, the main use case would be when you implement from string, it requires uh, you to specify the error type. And up to this point, if you, for example, have a non-failing from string, so for example, like the one you can see, we just assign uh, always the, always assign the string to the inside. There's no way this from string can fail. If we were to use the uh, the unit type, you would still have to do person from string and dot unwrap, even though the unwrap can literally never be called. Uh, because technically, from Rust's point of view, you could somehow construct the error variant, even though it won't happen practically. And this is when there's the key difference between the unit type and the exclamation mark, the uni unit type and the never type, is that if you use the never type, for example, as the error variant, Rust understands that the error variant could never be constructed because you cannot physically get value for the never type. So you can just pattern match it. And if you did this let OK person uh, equal sign with uh, with the uh, with the unit type, Rust would say that it's illegal. And yeah, technically, if you do this now, Rust would say the same, that it's irrefutable pattern that we don't cover the uh, the error pattern, even though we cannot cover it because we cannot construct the error pattern. But it's just limitation at this point and uh, the, 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 the work on the feature is still ongoing. So eventually, thanks to the never type, you would be just able to use the, uh, the pattern matching to just match on the OK variant and Rust will understand that the error can never happen and so it's safe. And next to ZSTs, we have BSTs. So when zero, Z, ZSTs uh, stood for, for... <laughs> thanks. So when ZS, uh, ZSTs stood for zero size types, DST stands for dynamically sized types. And if you wrote some code of Rust, you've probably found them uh, and chance to use them many times. For example, uh, string is dynamically sized. I mean, the STR. Uh, reference to string is not dynamically sized because it's always the size of the reference, so like four or eight bytes. String is not dynamically sized because it's a struct. It's always, for example, on 64-bit machines, uh, the big string is always 24 bytes. And um, uh, slices are dynamically sized because we don't know the number of elements up front. Uh, references to slices are not dynamically sized because you know references and vectors are not dynamically sized because vectors, uh, similarly to strings, are just structs with uh, with known sizes. So there's also one more. What would you say about the size of this type? It's it's pretty basic. There's no catch in here. It's 24 bytes for string, 8 bytes for the reference to slice, uh, plus some padding. And as it turns out, it's 40 bytes. I counted it using the size of function, so it's just not plain guessing. And if we change this type a bit, and if we remove the reference to slice, just leave it as it is right now, what would you say about the size of this type? 
well it's not it's not 24 bytes plus size of of this of this ball because we don't know the size of this tuple or sorry in the tuple of this uh, of this slice so yeah first thing first this is legal it's fine for struct's last field to be unsized and this makes the entire struct unsized it's hardly mentioned feature in the rastonomicon and once again i'm not sure if i found it somewhere in the wild but since it's coded it's probably used by someone and for example if we try to measure the size of the slice Rust will tell us that that it's not known up front it was before when the slice was a reference but when the slice is just a slice or if we for example made it a trait or use uh, lowercase str it would be unsized but this one is the last last field of the of this tract so yeah for dynamically sized types are like uh, traits lower cases strs named uh, slices and structs when last field is also unsized and the main characteristic of the unsized types is that you cannot assign them directly into local variables because variables have to be uh, sized because they are allocated in the stack so the compiler must always know the size of the type it's going to allocate so if you for example try to uh, compile this code uh, with named slice being unsized the rust will tell us that the size for values cannot be known at compile time and this is actually less two acronyms and um, Previously, I asked you, what do you think will be the size of this code, or the size of that struct? And now I'm asking you, what do you think the compiler will say about this code? And, well, the compiler will say that we're trying to break Rust and whether we would some ice. So yeah, the Rust, the Rust compiler has Easter eggs and it has bugs too. And what I'm... So yeah, let's unwrap the acronyms. IS is internal compiler error, and CDA is call to action. And my yeah, presentation broken. Yeah, and my IST for you would be to try to contributing to Rust C, Cargo, Rust FMT, or any product you find useful. And, and you get bonus points for fixing an actual IS in the compiler, but really even a single small commit to someone else's project can improve your on someone else's workflow on or at least make your or someone else's life better and just to, to recap this is the eight acronyms we went through with atc cta dst g80 hrtb ice oibit and zst um i hope they are not scary anymore honestly they scare me a bit too still um, but i think it's worth worth to know what's hidden beneath all this lifetime illusion mechanisms beneath all these uh, fancy acronyms we might sometimes encounter either in the error messages on in the uh, forums and yeah you can find lots of information on on these scary acronyms in the rastonomicon and yeah i think i think that's that and this was scary acronyms and super creeps i'm patrick and i'd like to thank you for attending